Nice to meet you, Jack. Nice to meet you too, Luke. Thank you so much. What an amazing place. I'm really looking forward to um, finding out about it. Thank you for the invitation today to this incredible place, right next to the Top Gear track, Dunsfold, um, surrounded by these amazing cars. Uh, which, which one's your favourite one here? So my personal favourite is probably the Porsche 962 Group C car that we've got here, just behind you. As a racing driver, it, it just it's a kind of a throwback to a golden era of Le Mans, and it, it's just such a nostalgic, cool car, something that I'd love to have a go in one day. So could you give me a brief history of how you know, Ledmore came into existence and, and the background to it all? There was this demand for a, a bespoke hub with the best facilities that could offer the complete management of classic cars and collectible cars, whether that be ranging from global logistics, servicing and restorations, but also offer a knowledge base that could be used and utilised to help with sales and acquisitions and anything you can think of in between. Um, can we also just talk a little bit about you? Um, and you know why you why you do this job? What is it about cars that you love? I race cars, and I started racing uh, cars when I was in my you know mid-teens. And through that, and going up the ranks, and the bigger and bigger series, and the skills and the knowledge I acquired from racing, you know, I brought over here and transferred them where I could. Um, cars are clearly passion assets. What? car or cars would you say you're most passionate about? I think for me the cars I'm most passionate about are a set of three cars from the 1990s and they are the, the GT1 Le Mans cars, the McLaren F1, the CLK GTR and the Porsche 911 GT1. They to me are the, the almost the purest expression of a supercar and race car. Okay now this is the one that everyone wants to know in terms of the cars you've got in this room, what's the rarest or most unusual you've got here? Well, client discretion is at the top of our priorities. So unfortunately, there's some I can't talk about, but there is one, I think, very unique and special one just over there that I can show you. So why don't we go have a look at it? Okay, sounds good. Wow, this is amazing. Well, here it is. This car might not stand out amongst its peers up here, what makes it special is its, its history and its story. Mm. This 1973 3.0 CSL was owned from new by James Bond himself, Sean Connery. Really? Yes. Oh, I goodness. mean, <laughs> it is, it, it, the car that the man drove, the state that we found it in wasn't quite this. Oh, really? No. We found it in an almost scrap heap ready pile. I mean, it was yeah. terrible. But over the past four years, we've been managing its restoration completely from the ground up to try to restore it to its former glory. Yeah. And we're proud to see it in the state it is today. Amazing, that's incredible. Can I see under the bonnet? Of course you can. So as you can see, it was a truly nut and bolt restoration. I also love these cars, the, uh, the beautiful windscreen, it's the curved glass, it's just gorgeous. Oh, it's fantastic. And I mean, the thing that I think really sets this car off is the fact that it's, you know, it's pillarless almost. It doesn't yeah. have, yeah. even a lot of modern cars have pillars, but it, it's, it's so open. And when the w windows drop, you know, it's just one nice big open, open space. Big open space. Yeah, incredible. Stunning. Wow. Yep. All the attention to detail That's carried amazing. on all throughout here, bringing it back to its completely original interior. Stunning. Amazing. So can I ask you to share some insights as to the, the type of investors and people that you have as clients? Well, I think due to the diverse range of services that we offer, we have collectors all around the world and from all different age groups and their collections varying so much and they're all so individual. A lot of collectors will have a favourite brand or model or era of cars and that can be reflected in the collections themselves, whether that be classic 60s British cars, uh, collectible Porsches, classic Ferraris, the analogue supercars of the 90s and all the way up to modern hypercars. You can comprise a car collection 
of just about anything, and there's no right or wrong reason for any of them. Can you give me an insight into how the demographics of your clients has changed over the years? Yes, well, I think one that's really interesting is we've started to see this new type of collector or interest, and that's from family offices and financial institutions. As classic cars and collectible cars have become this a new type of a bona fide asset class, they've been really interested to learn more and get involved with it. There are many motivations for collecting cars. I mean, from a personal perspective, I think they look absolutely stunning. And for me, it's the visual side. But can you give me a few other examples of what people look for? In, in more general terms, it's probably easier to say that there's a scale. And at one end, you've got those that collect purely for passion and the pleasure and enjoyment and just for the cars that they love and at the other you've got those that co have collections for purely financial reasons whether that be an inflationary hedge for tax reasons or a currency hedge but you tend to find that most collectors sit somewhere in the middle of that the value of cars can vary significantly can you give me a few ideas of the kind of things that affect its value well brand is a really key part of that and then following on from that you look at build numbers. It's a supply and demand market at the end of the day and rarity is really important. The other factors that we then look at are the history and its files is so important. It tells the life of the car, where the car's been, what it's done and who's looked after it to make sure it's been looked after properly. Has it been serviced with a famous, very reputable specialist or has it been serviced with your local garage? Servicing it with the right people is, is key to building that history and that provenance, which also can help build and keep the value of the car. If it's looked after poorly by the wrong people, it can have a big effect on the value. If it's looked after by the right people, it can also have a big effect on the value. And what is it you think gives the best investment potential for a car? Well, carrying on from what we said about build numbers, you actually have to delve into what we mean by by that and the provenance. Does it have race history? Was the model it was built on raced? Was it homologation special? Was it designed by someone famous? Did it have a famous owner? Is there something to do with its aesthetics? Is it aesthetically beautiful? Do the numbers match? Does the chassis number and the gearbox and the engine number all match correctly? How many owners did it have? Where was it delivered new? Does it have a complete history? Does it have traceable history? What's the colour and spec? Is it a manual? Is it a V12? Does it have something really unique about it? All of these things combined create good provenance and can really affect the investment potential of a car. First time buyers, I mean, I've never bought anything like this. It, for me, if I was buying one of these, what, would, what kind of things should I think about? I'd say buy the best you can afford. Don't buy a car that looks cheaper than another one because it's in a terrible condition. This is gonna lead almost certainly to a lot of stress if you don't know what you're doing. Look at how much money you have to spend and budget appropriately. Talk to a reputable specialist and get advice. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. You know, reach out to people that- Such as Ledmore. Such as Ledmore. <laughs> Could you give me some tips as to what things a, a buyer should consider when they're, when they're buying this car in terms of budget and ongoing costs? In basic general terms, budget for the consumables, insurance, storage if it's needed, and then have a look at the history file and previous bills, and that should give you a good idea of roughly running and service costs should be. So we've talked about value. What are the other sort of lesser known factors that might you know, affect the value of the car? It's all about uniqueness and rarity. It's a numbers game. Something as simple as colour and specification can make such a difference. For example, if you take a, a Rosso Corsa car, it's one of 200. If you take, for instance, a Grigio Allo car, it's one of two it becomes a lot rarer and they're a lot more desirable and unique. And that is the factors that helps drive value. Okay, turning now to the potential uh, ban on internal combustion engine cars, what's your thoughts on you know, how it's gonna affect the market? Um, is it gonna be going up? I think it will actually potentially be a good thing for the classic car and collectible car market. All of a sudden, it's a finite supply of these things. You look around, I mean, these are unrepeatable machines. 
that they will become even more unique in this electrified world. So I just want to ask you now a bit about what options there are for buyers looking to finance uh, the purchase of one of these cars. There are some excellent uh, specialist lenders and financers in the classic car world. They understand the value drivers and can take a very nuanced approach to it. And they can also hopefully be able to see investment potential of these cars and thereby be able to offer a more bespoke and tailored product compared to your high street bank or traditional lenders. Jack, thanks so much for having me. What a privilege to spend a day looking at these incredible cars. Hopefully I can come again soon. You'll be more than welcome anytime. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Let me walk you out. Thank you.